Hi, I'm Aaron Sampson, and in this course, I'll cover some fundamental elements of network communication, including routing and switching concepts, as well as IP addressing components. All right, in this presentation, we'll take a look at the three basic types of transmission in a network environment beginning with what's known as the unicast. Now, as its name indicates, uni means one, and this simply means that there is a specific address, a specific destination to which your packets are sent, and that destination will respond specifically back to just you. So there is a single destination and a single connection between the source and the destination over which your communication will occur. Now, in the graphic, you do see that there are two unicast conversations happening here, if you will, but they are separate and distinct from each other. So it simply means you can initiate multiple unicast communications, but they are separate from each other. So unicast A, as an example, might be copying a file from a server. Unicast B might be submitting a print job to a different server, but they would be completely separate and distinct from each other. So again, the two destinations, the file server and the print server, don't hear the communication happening between those other systems. As far as Unicast A is concerned, it is just a copy job with the source. There's nothing else happening. As far as Unicast B is concerned, it's just the print job. There's nothing else happening. So always a direct one-to-one -one communication. Now the effective opposite of that is the broadcast. And in a broadcast, the source sends out to every destination within the same network, or perhaps more accurately stated, the same subnet. Now we'll talk about that in greater detail a little bit later. But a common example of a broadcast communication is when a system initializes and requests an IP address from a DHCP server, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. When it initializes, if it is requesting an address, it must not yet have an address. Therefore, it can't really communicate. So it initializes just a minimal version of TCP IP with the ability to do little more than broadcast to everyone can somebody please supply me with an IP address? As long as there is a DHCP server in that subnet, it will hear the broadcast because everyone hears the broadcast and it will respond back to the source. That's only one example. There are several others where broadcasts are particularly useful. You do want to inform every other system within that subnet about something. But generally, you want to keep broadcasts minimal because in a lot of cases, the other systems just aren't concerned with that particular type of communication. And coming back to the DHCP example, the DHCP server is the only one that will respond to that type of request. All other systems hear the request, but they simply ignore it. So they do have to actually take the time to examine that packet, if you will, and say, oh, well, that's not for me. I'll just discard it. So too many broadcasts certainly aren't desirable. You want to keep them as minimal as possible, but in some cases they are necessary. Then there's a bit of a middle ground, if you will, the multicast. And in this case, we have a source sending out to multiple destinations, but not everyone. So these are defined by the administrators. You create multicast groups, and you can send to a single address from the source's perspective. But all of the destinations that have been added to that group will receive those packets. A common example of this is when you are deploying operating systems to perhaps just a specific group of systems, maybe in one office or on one floor. You just want to send the same packets to all of the systems in the group, but not in the entire network. So you can just create these smaller subsections, if you will, of the network that will receive those packets. 
Those are probably the least common of the three. In most communications, you will probably see the unicast as the most common, then the broadcast, and then the multicast. But it is, of course, up to the application, the type of service that you are using. But generally, unicast will result in, of course, the quietest network because all of the other systems do not hear the unicast conversations. So ideally, more unicasts are better. But again, there are certain circumstances where broadcasts and multicasts are necessary. Now, in this presentation, we will take a look at some of the characteristics of network communications and the types of networks that arise from those characteristics. Now, the first one is known as a broadcast domain, and this consists of all devices receiving a broadcast packet, and the broadcast packet can originate from any device. In terms of considerations, larger number of broadcasts can reduce available bandwidth and even impact the processing power of computers themselves. So typically, you want as few broadcasts as possible, but recognizing the boundaries of a broadcast domain can help you to reduce the overall number. Now, the reason they can actually impact the processing power is because a broadcast is heard by every system within the broadcast domain. So any given system that does not need to pay attention to that broadcast must quite literally stop whatever it's doing, examine that packet, say, I'm not concerned with that, and discard it. So too much of that can quite literally impact the overall processing power. So this is what it looks like. And again, the broadcast domain is not anything that you would set out to design, if you will, more to the point, you would want to try to reduce it as much as possible. But again, in some cases, broadcasts are necessary. But the reason I mentioned earlier about recognizing the boundary comes down to the router. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. But in this example, computer A, as the sending system, sends out the broadcast. Every system within the broadcast domain will hear that particular transmission. Most of them will likely not be concerned with it, so they will simply discard the packets. But too many broadcasts means that they have more work to do. So the router represents the boundary here because routers are inherently programmed to discard broadcast packets. And the reason for that is if they allowed them through the router to the next network and then to the next network and the next network, they quite literally could theoretically go forever including over the internet. So there has to be a means to say that's far enough. And that is the router. When a router receives a broadcast packet over one of its interfaces, it will simply discard it. That's why we see the recycle bin. So routers represent the means to limit your broadcast domains. But at the same time, you don't want tons and tons of routers in your environment because now you're managing too many networks or subnets. So there has to be a happy medium. But everything on the inside of that router does represent the broadcast domain. Now, there is also what's known as a collision domain. And this is any network segment where a collision can happen. Now, I'll talk about a collision in greater detail in a moment. But this is something typical to Ethernet networks. They consist of devices that are connected to a shared media, and we'll see what that looks like in a moment as well. But at any time, a collision can occur between any number of devices, particularly Ethernet hubs. So this is what the collision domain looks like. So coming back to the shared media, one of the problems here is the fact that we are seeing hubs being used. Hubs operate at the lowest layer of OSI, the physical. As such, they do not know about any kind of addressing. So anything that goes in one physical port of a hub comes out every other port. So as far as all of these computers are concerned, they are all sharing the same physical media. 
even though there are hubs that somewhat separate them, this represents a single shared media. So Computer X certainly can communicate with Computer Y, and it can even do so using a specific IP address, but hubs don't understand IP addresses. Therefore, the packets still end up arriving at all of the other systems. So the collision then is if computers X and Y try to communicate at the exact same time as computers A and B. Because the hubs cannot distinguish the addresses, every system receives all of those packets. And if they end up on that shared media at the same time, the packets will quite literally collide with each other and destroy each other. These are electrical signals, so they will interfere with each other to the point where they are just no longer recognizable. That is a collision. Now, you see the switch at the end of the collision domain in this case. Switches can stop collisions because they are able to understand addresses. Now, we'll talk about that in greater detail later, but a switch has the capability to make a virtual connection between two systems by knowing their addresses. A switch is aware of the MAC address. It operates at layer two, the data link layer. And we find in the data link layer, the media access control sublayer or MAC address. So they can stop the collision from going through the switch. But again, on the inside of it, where we see those hubs, that represents the possibility for collisions to occur. Now, this was known at the time of Ethernet being developed. So to try to reduce this, there was a protocol implemented known as CSMA slash CD or carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. A carrier is the physical media. We have multiple systems trying to access it. So let's sense that media so that we can better manage the traffic and also detect when collisions occur. So it determines how network devices respond when simultaneous requests are made on the same data channel. In other words, when a collision occurs. It's used to monitor traffic amongst devices on a network. And if a collision occurs, the devices will attempt to retransmit after a random time interval. So collision has happened. They will recognize that and say, all right, I'll try again. But they'll all do it in sort of a staggered, randomized fashion to try to reduce the chance of another collision. Now there is also CSMA CA, which is collision avoidance. So now we can detect and even avoid collisions in the first place. The system will sense or listen for collisions prior to transmitting the data. So it will effectively inform other devices not to broadcast. It actually sends out a dummy packet, if you will. And if that does not collide, then it can assume to send out the real data. But that can impact network traffic as well because it's taking the time to listen. It's sending out this dummy packet. So ultimately, this can slow things down a little bit as well. But if you can avoid the collisions in the first place, then you don't have to worry about detecting them and retransmitting. Now, all of that said, CSMA, CA, and CD aren't nearly as much of a concern anymore because I mentioned earlier switches are much better at handling the communications because they are aware of addresses. So they can directly connect system A to system B using the address and all of the other systems do not participate in the communication. So there's a much lesser chance of a collision ever occurring. It doesn't reduce them entirely, but in the earlier days of networking environments, switches were much more expensive. Hubs, were inexpensive and easy to implement. So there were a lot more collisions back in those days. But these days, switches are implemented just about everywhere. So collisions are far less of a concern.
One of the fundamental goals of network design is to keep traffic as isolated as possible, or the process of segmentation. So in this presentation, we'll take a look at some of the basic components involved with segmenting your network environment, beginning with VLANs or virtual local area networks. The idea here is that we have all of these systems connected to the same physical switch, but we can use software configuration within the switch to isolate systems from each other. The systems in VLAN 1, for all intents and purposes, believe that they have their own dedicated switch. The systems in VLAN 2, same thing. So most of the traffic occurring between those systems stays within that VLAN. If it has to cross over to the other VLAN, it certainly can, but we have effectively isolated the traffic that is most common amongst those systems. Now, trunking extends this because, of course, most, most environments aren't able to get by with just a single switch. So here we see multiple switches, but take note that the location of the systems behind each respective switch does not affect their ability to be in the same VLAN. So the trunk builds a logical connection between the two and in fact allows systems on different sides of those switches to actually be in the same VLAN. We see VLAN 1 is the dotted line and VLAN 2 is the solid line and there is a mix of both on either side. So you can have these VLANs that extend beyond even more than two, you can have multiple switches with multiple VLANs configured with trunks in between them to still allow membership in really any VLAN, regardless of which physical switch they might be connected to. Now, tagging ports is a definition that is defined by what's known as the IEEE 802.1Q specification. You might be familiar with IEEE 802.11 for wireless communications. That's just a task force that uh, in essence defines the rules of many types of network communication. So you can search this up for a full definition, but it's used when multiple VLANs exist per port. And that again goes back to what I was just talking about a minute ago, multiple switches with multiple VLANs. In that case, tags are used as VLAN identifiers to direct traffic to the appropriate VLAN. So if behind any given port, there are several other switches with several VLANs defined, we need a way to identify that this packet is destined for VLAN 1, and this one is destined for VLAN 2, and so on. Now this would not be required when a VLAN segmented network consists of only a single switch. It knows which VLANs reside behind each physical port. So it's only required when there are multiple switches with multiple VLANs. Port mirroring is not so much used for segmentation, but it does, in essence, duplicate the traffic that is coming across any given port, hence the term mirroring and it does track the source and the destination addresses, but it's more so used to capture the traffic between devices while mirroring only the frames that contain a source ID and a destination ID. Uh, this is typically used for troubleshooting if you're trying to detect missing frames, for example. So you can literally create this mirrored network, which officially counts as segmentation, but all it does is just capture up the packets so that you can analyze them to try to find out what's wrong in certain scenarios. Now, a MAC address table is a fundamental component of the switch. It allows it to dynamically build address tables using the MAC source address frames it receives from the system that is sending through that switch. So again, this is where switches are different from hubs Hubs do not have this ability. So anything going in one physical port goes out every other physical port. Switches can use these tables to determine where to forward the appropriate traffic on any given LAN. So as every system communicates through the switch, it knows that system X is physically connected to port X, and that's its MAC address. So when anything comes in for that system, it knows it should send it out over that port. So it does not have to send it out over every port.
Now, since we know that switches operate at the MAC address level, we need another protocol known as the Address Resolution Protocol, or ARP. This is used to map IP addresses to physical machine addresses, or MAC addresses, because switches understand the MAC address, but almost all communications are using an IP address. So we need a way to maintain this mapping. ARP tables do exactly that. They say that this MAC address is currently using that IP address. And bear in mind, your IP address can change. So the ARP table needs to be updated from time to time. But the protocol rules support address conversion in both directions, meaning it can equate either one to either one. If it sees the IP, it can map it to the MAC. If it sees the MAC, it can map it to the IP. Now, because we know about those MAC tables, this can actually introduce a possibility known as a switching loop, whereby for any given reason, the switch has cleared its MAC table and it is at the moment not aware of which systems are connected to which ports. And in most cases, there are multiple switches that are connected to each other redundantly for fault tolerance so that if one does go down, we have an alternate path. So if those two scenarios line up, we might see a switch go down or we might see a MAC table cleared. The workstation might attempt to connect to the file server. It will first hit switch four and it will pass it out through to the appropriate switch based on its table. But if it does not see an entry for the file server, then it has to send it out over every port, asking the other switches if they have entries for the file server. If they don't have entries, they will send it out over every port, with the exception of the port it came in from in the first place. So every other switch is basically hearing this request for the file server, but nobody has it in its table. So it basically just keeps bouncing around the switches. Now there is a protocol known as the spanning tree protocol, which detects this looping, if you will, and can stop it. But it is something to be aware of. And finally, the demilitarized zone or DMZ also known as a perimeter network, is the process of using firewalls which only allow the appropriate ports to be open to communicate with the appropriate types of systems. So typically what you'll see is the internet, then a firewall that only allows the ports to communicate with certain systems in the DMZ, the buffer zone. Those systems do need to be exposed to the internet, but I don't want somebody to be able to hit one of those systems and then use it to attack one of my internal systems. So there's another firewall that only allows the appropriate ports from the DMZ to the internal network. So again, this creates this little buffer zone where systems that need to be exposed can be, but we don't want to expose our entire internal network. So we use two firewalls to separate those systems and allow them to access the internet while still providing a certain amount of protection for the internal network. So all of those approaches ultimately result in some form of segmentation of your network. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the basic difference between hubs and switches and ultimately routers. And the question is commonly asked because in certain scenarios, it can seem like they're performing similar functions. But the official answer is to know what layer of the OSI model each device operates. But that's difficult to visualize. So let's take a closer look. And we'll start with the hub. The hub is used to connect systems within a LAN or different segments of a LAN. But the hub resides at the physical layer and is unaware of any kind of addressing scheme. So anything that goes in one port of the hub comes out every other port. Now, the switch is a networking device that filters and forwards packets between LAN segments. Now, it doesn't have to be between LAN segments. It could be between any two hosts. But I'm going to go with that definition for the time being to help visualize this. And we'll see a diagram in a moment. 
but the switch operates at the data link layer and as such it is aware of mac addresses so as you connect a system to the switch and a packet flows through the switch it will learn of that mac address and now it knows that system is connected to that port so once the system communicates through the switch, the switch will know every system by its address. So it doesn't have to send packets out every port. If I'm in physical port one and you're in physical port five, it'll only send it out that physical port. So that's the idea of filtering and forwarding the packets appropriately. So here's an example where we see hubs and switches. On the left side of the switch, we have a hub as we do on the right side. So in this example, it is for lack of a better word, fairly noisy on each side. And by that, I mean, the hub doesn't know anything about addressing. So everything going in any port of the hub is coming out every other port. So the client in the top left trying to communicate with the server can certainly do so. But the client, the bottom left receive those packets as well. So it's noisy. It is a part of a collision domain. And the same thing happens on the right hand side. There's only two systems there. But the idea is that everything going on in one port of the hub is coming out every other port. So the switch can be used to isolate these two segments from each other because the switch sees the MAC addresses. So if a packet from the client in the top left is destined for the server, it will not forward that packet over to the right hand side. So you isolate these two segments from each other. It's noisy within each segment, but at least quiet between them. Now, this is a fairly old implementation because again, in the early days of networking, switches were a lot more expensive with, than hubs. So this was common back in those days. But today, switches are far less expensive and hubs are more or less extinct. So now it is common to see distributed switches, which just means that we connect our switches to each other to create a common switched environment. Notice that we also connect each host directly to a switch. This will function as a single broadcast domain, just as it was before, but now we prevent any collisions from occurring. Each segment becomes an isolated collision domain. In the end, all the switches will learn all the MAC addresses of all the devices on the network and know which port to use in forwarding them. The switch on the left will use the top port to reach that client. If the switch on the right has a message addressed for that client's MAC address, it will use its port here on the left because that is the closest port in the direction of forwarding from one switch to another. With that said, now we see the router in between switches. So this looks fairly familiar. So now we have switches connecting the systems within each section. So the router itself is a networking device that forwards packets between the networks. But routers are not concerned with directly connecting hosts to each other, only networks. And again, this comes back to the OSI model. You'll remember when we had hubs, things were noisy. Once we introduce a directly connected switch to the host, things get a lot quieter because direct communication between this client and the server, for example, is not going to affect anyone else in this network. But remember, when we send out a broadcast message, that still will be forwarded by the switch to all devices because the indicated destination of a broadcast is everyone and the switch will obey that. When we progress forward to a routed network, we now see that we essentially have two networks. This would have to be two separate networks. And if you were to look at the IP addresses, instead of a single block of, let's say, 192.168.0, it would have to be 192.168.0 on the left, maybe, and 192.168.1 on the right. So these are two separate and distinct networks. These are segments on the same network. So in terms of functionality, it's quite similar. We can see traffic being isolated on either side of the router, but the network address has to be different in this configuration. And we get the benefit of switches being much better at quieting things down within each network. We're not seeing traffic between those systems that should not receive it. The switch handles that by filtering by using MAC addresses. And when it needs to cross the router to the other side, it certainly can because there's an IP address in use. So again, this is where the different layers of the OSI are doing their jobs.
we see them filtering traffic based on addresses. And in this case, it's happening at two levels, filtering based upon the MAC address within the switch and then further filtering within the router based upon IP address. But again, ultimately, it's the idea of filtering and forwarding traffic only when appropriate, of course, attractive to network design. This quiets things down tremendously and keeps the traffic where it belongs. In this presentation, we'll take a look at programming routers. The first method is called static routing. And in this scenario, an administrator manually types a network ID and the next hop router IP address for each and every network. This is cumbersome to do at large scale, but useful for simple scenarios where all packets leaving a company go directly to an ISP, for example. To provide scalability, we use dynamic routing protocols, which allow routers to communicate with each other and share the routes that they handle, keeping each other up to date. They aren't transport protocols like TCP or UDP. They aren't really concerned with moving data packets around, but rather just informing each other that I know about these routes. What routes do you know about? And that can be passed on from router to router to router so that when you start getting into very large routing environments, any given router does not need to know the entire path to any given destination, just the next router. Now, Routing Information Protocol, or RIP, is an example of a distance vector protocol. RIP comes in two versions. The more current version is two, but they're both distance vector routing protocols. And that means that they, in essence, consider how many routers have to be crossed to get from source to destination to determine what is the best path. Again, once you get into very large routing environments such as the internet, there can be several paths to get from point A to point B. So a distance vector literally considers the sheer quantity of routers it must cross to get there along any path, and it will select the shortest one. So that requires that the routers share their routing information with each other to figure out what is the best path. So routers maintain routing tables, which list all the destinations to which that particular router can send the packet. So again, it does not have to be all the way around the world, for example, it really just has to be the next router or to a few other routers. But as long as it can continue moving the packet from router to router, and the next router knows the next step, then ultimately packets can arrive at their destination. So again, the distance vector algorithm simply selects the shortest path. Now this is an open standard and fairly easy to implement. For the most part, you just enable it on the router and the routers that can see each other start communicating with each other and sharing that information but routers will only learn of adjacent routers. So it's analogous to navigating to a hospital with only road signs. Now, the next type of protocol is a link state protocol. And Open Shortest Path First, or OSPF, is an example of this. It's still an open, not proprietary protocol that determines the best path for packet delivery and was designed as a replacement for RIP. All OSPF routers share their identity and all of their NICs, their speeds, and their IP addresses with all other OSPF routers in their area. Each router can then independently determine the shortest path from their orientation to a destination network. In simpler terms, link state routing protocols are aware of the conditions of the route. So if, for example, there's a slow link somewhere down the line, OSPF can route around it. It might not be the shortest path in terms of hops, but it's the shortest path in terms of cost. OSPF is like navigating to a hospital with a GPS. In fact, the algorithm used by OSPF is also used in GPS systems. There is also an enhanced or hybrid distance vector routing protocol called Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, or EIGRP. It's called a hybrid because it has some link state-like tendencies. EIGRP enables routers to establish adjacency with each other and can recognize when there is a need to send an update. Additionally, like OSPF, it incorporates link speed into its decision-making logic rather than just hop counts. But like RIP, EIGRP information is like a rolling snowball moving away from the destination network with each router learning about the route from their neighbor rather than determining their own route from a network map like OSPF. EIGRP is not an open standard, but it's a protocol owned by the network vendor Cisco.
On the internet, between ISPs, Border Gateway Protocol, or BGP, is used to populate route information. And it uses routing and reachability information. So again, it uses a combination of the distance and that reachability. Can I get there over this path? Are all the routers alive and well? So it directs packets between what's known as autonomous systems, or ASs. And that simply means a routing environment that's managed by a specific organization. So if you have company X and you have a lot of routes within that environment and you manage the whole thing, that's known as an autonomous system. It operates on its own, so it directs packets between those autonomous systems. And BGP is commonly used to connect autonomous systems to other autonomous systems, WAN to WAN, for example. So again, that is not always used for internet routing, but it certainly can be. Sometimes you'll see a fairly dedicated connection between my organization and someone else's. So you might see BGP in that case where I'm an autonomous system, you're an autonomous system, we're routing between them. So those, again, are different types of routing protocols. And the idea is really just so that the routers themselves can communicate with each other and exchange the information in their tables. One last piece of information on programming routers. Both static and dynamic routing can populate the gateway of last resort, which is used for default routing. This is a route that functions like a wildcard to say, if I don't know any better, more specific route, then forward the packet to this listed router. So just like a computer has a default gateway, a router will often have a very similar default route to get out of its network. Now, in this presentation, we'll take an introductory look at IPv6, which, of course, is the upgrade to IPv4. But it's not all that new. It's been around for quite some time now. In fact, Windows-based systems have been using it as the default protocol ever since Vista. IP version 4 was there, too, but any two systems running IPv6 would prefer it over IPv4. Now, the most notable feature of IPv6 is the length of the address. The address was lengthened to accommodate the future growth of the internet, and to say lengthened is an enormous understatement. It went from a 32-bit address in IPv4 to 128 bits in IPv6. Remember that in binary, 32 bits means that if you have 2 to the 32nd power, or approximately 4 billion combinations, 2 to the power of 128, however, is 340 trillion 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 or 340 undecillion if you want to impress your friends. This is a practically inexhaustible address space. So we see how this absolutely rectifies the impending shortage of IP addresses in version 4. Now, it also has support for auto configuration, which helps to correct any limitations of version 4 in that regard. And we'll talk about those in greater detail in a moment. Now, in terms of how it's expressed, there's still a conversion. It is ultimately still binary, as we just saw. It is 128 bits, but it is expressed in hexadecimal, not standard decimal, if you will, like 192.168.0.1. So this is what it looks like expressed in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal accommodates 16 values, the digits 0 through 9, and then the letters A through F. So each section of four characters is 16 bits. Now don't worry too much about how that conversion is done at this point. But in terms of expressing the address itself, if you see all those zeros put together like that, even just one time, even if there's just four zeros, they can be condensed by simply putting the colons together. So that certainly shortens the address. And in fact, if even one of those sections begins with a zero, you can actually leave that out as well. So the second quartet, if you will, could actually be expressed as CD8, and TCPIP knows that the zero wasn't expressed. So this is what it looks like in binary. And again, in terms of the conversion, it's still the same process as version 4. So there are four bits in each little section there. So the very first bit on the right of any given 4 is the 1 bit. The second one is the 2 bit, the 4 bit, and then the 8 bit. So that very first one you see in the group of binary digits represents the 2 in hexadecimal. 
Then the first zero in hexadecimal is represented by four zeros. The second zero in hexadecimal is expressed by another four zeros. Then the one in hexadecimal is expressed by the one bit being on and the other three being off. So that's 2001, if you will, of the first quartet down below. Is the 001 for the two bit, zero, then all zeros, all zeros, and 0001. So it takes those 16 bits to express those four characters. So again, in total, it's 128 bits. So just a tremendously large address space. Now, the dual stack means that both protocols can be used at the same time. You cannot uninstall TCP IP from a system such as Windows, but you can disable either one if you want to. You just turn it off. But by default, both of them are there and both of them are enabled. So depending on the application or the type of communication you're initiating with any other system, you might see either protocol used. Network devices such as routers and switches support both version 4 and version 6. So whenever version 6 communication is possible, it does become the preferred method. Now, it's not just a matter of the larger address space, but also the fact that as a newer protocol, it's quite simply has been fine-tuned to address the types of communication that are much more common these days. Most mo notably, things like voice over IP and video conferencing, real-time communication. IPv6 is much more efficient than v4 at those types of communications. So again, it's not always just a matter of is the protocol enabled, but what's the application? What are we using it for? It often determines which protocol will be used. Another transition technology besides a dual stack is using IPv6 tunneling. An IPv6 tunnel encapsulates IPv6 packets inside of IPv4 packets in order to traverse an IPv4 network such as the internet. These tunnels enable isolated IPv6 networks to communicate without having to support an IPv6 infrastructure end-to-end. -end. The concept is very analogous to a standard VPN from one private network to another. Now, router advertisement is a feature that allows the client systems to recognize that a router is out there. So the router quite literally says, here I am, and the client picks up on that. So where in IPv4, you typically had to use something like DHCP to inform a client, here's your IP address, here is your subnet mask, here is your default gateway. IPv6 does not need to do that. The routers quite literally advertise their presence. The clients hear that. They know where their nearest router is now, so in essence, they can configure the default gateway on their own. So this is actually a component known as neighbor discovery. This performs tasks such as router discovery, duplicate address detection, prefix discovery, and stateless address auto configuration. So this is that auto configuration component that was mentioned earlier. So the idea being that IPv6, in essence, takes care of itself. When you turn your system on and it realizes that IPv6 is there, it initializes its own address. It does this router discovery. It does the prefix discovery. And all this basically results in a stateless address configuration. So this NDP message type, that's neighbor discovery protocol, includes neighbor advertisement, which is basically saying, here I am, I'm advertising to my neighbors, I'm here. Neighbor solicitation is kind of the opposite, saying, who's out there? And router advertisement, again, is the router saying, well, here I am. So since these systems are advertising and soliciting from each other, they can detect the fact that two systems happen to initialize with the same address. Highly unlikely, but should it happen, one of them will reinitialize with a new address. So it quite literally can configure itself. So it does have some significant benefits over IPv4. In this presentation, we'll take a look at some performance concepts of managing network traffic. And the first approach is what's known as traffic shaping, also sometimes referred to as packet shaping. But the idea behind this is to regulate network data transfers to ensure a certain level of performance and or quality of service. Now, it does so by prioritizing various traffic streams, meaning that certain packets can actually be delayed because they're deemed to be less important. Now, what might that actually look like? Well, if you are communicating within any given network environment, 
there may be certain things that quite simply demand better performance. If you are, for example, having a video conference, then that should probably have higher priority than sending an email. It's not critical if that email arrives five seconds later or even a few minutes later. But video conferencing, if those packets are delayed, then everything gets garbled up and really becomes difficult to understand. So you can imagine that the video conference is quite simply a higher priority type of transmission. Therefore, we can shape the traffic to give priority to those packets. So some other examples, really when it uh, comes to any time sensitive data, that might be considered a little higher priority. Another example might be voice over IP systems. Any business related traffic that is simply deemed to be a little more important than anything else. It is more important for me to post this file to my web server than it is to submit a print job, things like that. And internet service providers might use this, particularly if the traffic is being shaped for an independent reseller, someone who is reselling their service for a specific purpose. Throttling bandwidth for certain applications. Again, based on the application, you can say, well, this one has a higher priority than that one. You can also implement two-tiered internet services, a regular subscription or a premium subscription. And of course, those who pay more get faster service. It's prioritized for the premium subscription. The next one is called quality of service or QoS. And this is a measurement of overall performance for networks based on things like transmission rates and error rates. And in essence, it's just trying to put it all together, if you will, to try to improve things like traffic shaping so we can better understand how the packets are actually being transferred. So we can examine the prioritization, the queuing, and the application classification of all of these transfers to better improve things like shaping the traffic. DiffServe or differentiated services is a protocol used to specify and control network traffic by class. So you quite simply classify the different types of transmissions. So based on the classification, certain traffic gets a certain precedence. For example, voice traffic may get precedence considering it requires an uninterrupted flow of data. Now, this depends on complex policy and rule statements when forwarding network packets, but it avoids simple priority tagging. That is quite simply tagging each packet with a priority. That can be somewhat time consuming and really can chew up additional resources because of course it has to tag every packet. So this simply looks at the classification rather than a process of tagging. So it can get a little complex if you have a lot of applications and a lot of different rules, but it does avoid that process of tagging. Class of service groups similar types of traffic on a network to manage the overall traffic for things like email, video streams, voice streams, and file transfers, particularly large documents. So again, when it sees those similar types of communications, it just puts them together into, if you will, into these classifications to try to maintain and manage each one a little more effectively as a separate type of class. So unlike quality of service, it does not offer any kind of guaranteed level of service, but rather a best effort in terms of bandwidth and delivery time. So the main class of service technologies, in fact, include 802.1p, which is layer two tagging. We just talked about tagging. Type of service, just what kind of communication is it, like we just saw, email, voice, or video. And in fact, differentiated services, or diffserve, is an approach uh, that qualifies, if you will, as a class of service. So one way or another, these are all related to trying to maintain the best communication possible based on the type of communication, because quite simply, other types are, for lack of a better description, more important than others. So they should get priority.
In this presentation, we'll take a look at two network services known as NAT and PAT. Beginning with NAT, this is Network Address Translation. And this is used by a network device to assign a public address to a device within a private network. Now, that device is a router. And as you can see by the graphic, one interface is connected to the public internet. And that address of 17.2.3.4 is a publicly visible IP address. The other interface, 10.0.0.1, is a private address, and it is only visible to the other systems on the inside of the router, if you will. Those systems using 10.0.0.3, 4, 5, and 6, they would all see 10.0.0.1 as their default gateway. So this limits the number of public IP addresses that are used by an organization or company because we only now need one public IP address for everyone to get to the internet. But this introduces a problem. Every packet sent by every system using TCP IP includes the destination address, where the packet is going, and the source address, where it came from, and the source address is used as the return address for the other system. So in other words, if I'm trying to get to a web page, the web server needs to know where should those packets be sent back. So as the packet leaves my system, let's say I'm 10.0.0.3, the return address is 10.0.0.3. If that were to pass out to the public internet, to the web server, the router that exists in that environment, wherever the web server is, would see 10.0.0.3 as the return address. And every router is programmed to say, well, that is a private address. Therefore, I will never forward a packet destined for that address out onto the public internet. So from the perspective of the web server, it cannot return the packets to a private address. So this is where network address translation steps in. As the packet hits the router, the router strips off 10.0.0.3 as the return address and inserts 17.2.3.4, the public address, which is entirely visible to the web server and the router on the other side. But then it's up to the router to remember that the request came from me in the first place. So it does have the advantages of preventing the depletion of the IP version for address space because we only need one public address. And it provides an additional layer of security because there is only one publicly visible address. And it offers increased flexibility when connecting to the public internet because we can use the private IP version for addressing system and we can use it however we want. All of those private addresses can be used by any organization however they see fit without affecting each other and without affecting the public internet. But because it does have to remember those requests, there are some disadvantages. Most notably, it consumes processor and memory resources on the router itself. It has to remember all of the requests that came in from the internal environment that then had to be forwarded out to the internet, and it has to make sure that all of the packets coming back get back to the correct systems. So this can cause IP version 4 communication delays, and it can also cause loss of end device IP traceability. Sometimes you might want to audit to see what's going on, who's doing what, but ultimately the router can only remember so much. So it starts kicking out old data in favor of newer data so you can lose that traceability and in some cases it's just not compatible with certain technologies or applications you might not know until you try but you may encounter something that says it's not compatible with NAT. Now PAT is port address translation and this is an extension to NAT and it enables multiple network devices to be mapped to a single IP address now, I'm just going to give you a fairly common example to help illustrate this. If I'm a network administrator 
I might very often need access to my servers from outside of the environment when I'm home, when I'm traveling. So for all intents and purposes, in those situations, I am on the internet. From my perspective, the only IP address that is visible to me is the public address, in this case, 129.123. So only one address. But I might need to get to three different servers, 10.0.0.1.2 and .3. So if I can only see one address, how do I distinguish one system from another? Well, this is where port forwarding comes into play or port address translation. I can open up an application such as Remote Desktop and I can enter in the public IP address of 129.123, but that's the same in all three cases. But then I put in a colon and the port number. This distinguishes the ultimate destination. So if it sees 1001 as the port number, I can configure the router to forward that request to 10.0.0.1. And if it sees port 1002, send it to system 2, and 1003, send it to system 3. So that allows me to access each one of those systems independently using a single address. And this is often called port forwarding in the router itself. So this has the advantage of, again, conserving IP addresses. I don't need three public addresses to get to my three servers. I only need one. And the private addresses themselves are not exposed to the public network. This helps to limit attacks originating from the public network because the intruders don't know what they are. So they can't launch targeted attacks against a specific private address. But there are still some disadvantages. It can become a little more complicated in larger networks, particularly with those remote logins. There can be an awful lot of servers that people are trying to get to, for example, and it can be difficult to trace and track. And there can be a limited internal table. Now that's in the device itself, and it depends on how robust the router is. But just to give you a simple example, the home routers that most of us have do support PAT and port forwarding, but they usually only have maybe between five and 10 entries. That's usually plenty for a home environment, but if you had a lower end router in your corporate environment, you might run out of port forwarding rules, or you might just simply lose track of the connections that are being made. Now, more robust routers support more rules and are better at maintaining the connections and keeping track of them, but it is still a possibility and something to consider. But ultimately, both NAT and PAT allow easier access from private addresses to the public internet and vice versa. Now, in this presentation, we'll take a look at port forwarding, which is very similar in concept to what was just discussed in the previous presentation when we talked about port address translation. This is just a bit of a different approach. So it's still a method that's used to make a device on a private network accessible to devices on the internet, even when behind a router, or perhaps more specifically stated, especially when behind a router. Now, this is commonly used in scenarios such as online gaming servers, peer-to-peer -peer downloading, voice over IP type applications, including Skype, Viber, and Uvu. But the difference between port forwarding and port address translation is more so the application that is being used. I gave the example in the previous presentation of using something like remote desktop to establish a connection through to a server. But in that case, it's up to me to explicitly state this particular port to get to that particular system. In port forwarding, you essentially just set up rules that are more so based on the application and or their default protocols. So to give you a better idea of what that looks like, if I have an external connection that will go to a gateway, 
and specify the port number of the appropriate service, then the port forwarding rule handles this automatically. So the example is, if I have a public IP address that I'm trying to reach, 216.69.20.1, and I'm using a web browser, then that request automatically specifies port 80. That is the default port for HTTP. So it is simply the fact that I'm using a browser to reach that address that informs the router this is the appropriate service, the appropriate type of request that's coming in. The gateway will then forward the request to the relevant server, in this case, the web server. So all traffic that is coming in destined for port 80 will automatically be forwarded to the private address of the web server inside the network. For instance, 10.1.1.10. So I didn't have to open my browser and explicitly state port 80. That is the default port for the HTTP protocol. So other applications, many other applications, have those default port configurations as part of the application. So really all I have to do is use the correct application to get to the correct service. Now this is actually a service that is supported by fairly low level routers such as Home or Soho routers. That stands for Small Office Home Office. They do allow port forwarding. So you can host these internet type of services from within a Soho network, including FTP, email servers, web servers, really anything you want, because you can configure the rule for any type of service. That's your call. But those are some of the common ones that might be available by default. Now, you might be limited in terms of the numbers with a Soho router. You might only be able to configure five or 10 rules, but you can still support these type of services. And again, it just means that you don't have to worry about explicitly stating the correct type of port as long as it uses the associated application for that service, then the port forwarding rule will send it automatically to the correct server to service that request. Now, in this presentation, we'll take a look at port forwarding, which is very similar in concept to what was just discussed in the previous presentation when we talked about port address translation. This is just a bit of a different approach. So it's still a method that's used to make a device on a private network accessible to devices on the internet, even when behind a router, or perhaps more specifically stated, especially when behind a router. Now this is commonly used in scenarios such as online gaming servers, peer-to-peer -peer downloading, voice over IP type applications, including Skype, Viber, and Uvu. But the difference between port forwarding and port address translation is more so the application that is being used. I gave the example in the previous presentation of using something like remote desktop to establish a connection through to a server. But in that case, it's up to me to explicitly state this particular port to get to that particular system. In port forwarding, you essentially just set up rules that are more so based on the application and or their default protocols. So to give you a better idea of what that looks like, if I have an external connection that will go to a gateway, and specify the port number of the appropriate service, then the port forwarding rule handles this automatically. So the example is, if I have a public IP address that I'm trying to reach, 216.69.20.1, and I'm using a web browser, then that request automatically specifies port 80. That is the default port for HTTP. So it is simply the fact that I'm using a browser to reach that address that informs the router, this is the appropriate service, the appropriate 
type of request that's coming in. The gateway will then forward the request to the relevant server, in this case, the web server. So all traffic that is coming in destined for port 80 will automatically be forwarded to the private address of the web server inside the network. For instance, 10.1.1.10. So I didn't have to open my browser and explicitly state port 80. That is the default port for the HTTP protocol. So other applications, many other applications, have those default port configurations as part of the application. So really all I have to do is use the correct application to get to the correct service. Now this is actually a service that is supported by fairly low level routers such as Home or Soho routers. That stands for Small Office Home Office. They do allow port forwarding. So you can host these internet type of services from within a Soho network, including FTP, email servers, web servers, really anything you want, because you can configure the rule for any type of service. That's your call. But those are some of the common ones that might be available by default. Now, you might be limited in terms of the numbers with a Soho router. You might only be able to configure five or 10 rules, but you can still support these type of services. And again, it just means that you don't have to worry about explicitly stating the correct type of port as long as it uses the associated application for that service, then the port forwarding rule will send it automatically to the correct server to service that request. In this presentation, we'll take a look at access control lists or ACLs. And if you are familiar with even standard file permissions in a network environment, these are essentially the same things. They determine who and or what can use a particular resource. In this case, the resource is a network interface. So they're used by routers and some switches to restrict data flows to and from various network interfaces. The interfaces are configured to use the ACLs to analyze data as it arrives at the interface, and it is then compared to the criteria specified in the ACL. Now that's up to you, but if the conditions are met, the traffic is permitted. If the conditions are not met, the traffic is denied. So in terms of use cases, you can enable basic security for a network using ACLs. They aren't as secure as firewalls, but you can enable protection for those network interfaces, and it's another layer of protection. You can restrict updates for routing from network peers. You can explicitly state that any given router should only accept updates from these specific routers. So you can ultimately help to define the overall flow of traffic in your network environment. Now, another approach is placing these rules on external routers to filter traffic from less desirable networks and perhaps those that use vulnerable protocols. And this allows you to effectively create this demilitarized zone, which is just a buffer, again, between your internal organization and the external WAN, or in most cases, the internet. So certain systems have to be exposed to the internet, such as web servers. So they're placed in the DMZ. And you can, again, implement ACLs to specifically state that traffic from the external side is going to be allowed based on the following conditions. But then you can perhaps implement tighter controls on the inside so you can still control it at different levels if you will so the internal router will typically have more restrictive acl so it's a little more flexible if you will a little looser on the outside because you aren't always sure who is going to be accessing the systems in the dmz but you also then want to ensure that if somebody does compromise a system in the dmz 
that it's harder for them to get through that system to the internal network. Now, again, this is typically implemented with firewalls, but you can still use ACLs as well. So you can protect the internal network from outside threats. And these are commonly configured using explicit permit or deny statements. So again, it's just a matter of saying on the outside where you know things need to be a little looser, we can still configure a few rules to allow them to get to the web server or whatever else, but on the inside, we'll tighten things up a little bit. Tighter controls to ensure that only the appropriate traffic reaches the internal organization. And as mentioned, you can absolutely use firewalls as well. This is just another layer. So it doesn't ever really hurt to have more protection. So your access control lists can help to increase the overall security of your environment. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the distinction between public and private IP addresses. Now, beginning with the public, this is an IP address that is assigned by an internet service provider for use by a home or business. Public IP addresses differentiate devices that are connected to the public internet, and they do have to be globally unique. So some examples include web servers, DNS servers, and network routers. So web servers in particular are a very good example. If I want to access a website, it needs to be available to the general public. Everyone should be able to see my web server. But as such, it needs to be a unique address. My web server has to be distinguishable from your web server. So the problem here is that TCP IP version 4, which remains the standard today, did not really have enough addresses to accommodate what the internet has become. Now, we'll talk about this in greater detail later on, but the IP version 4 address space is fairly large by what we might consider to be a large number. In theory, it does accommodate over 4 billion addresses. But in practice, nowhere near that many are actually used. There are a lot of addresses that quite simply are not used in public IP addressing. So that said, the growth of the internet has really exceeded what TCP IP version 4 can accommodate. Now, that's why IP version 6 primarily came into existence. That's another topic. We will talk about that in greater detail later on as well. But as it stands, the number of publicly available version 4 addresses is coming close to, if not already at, its limits in terms of the number of globally unique addresses. So the problem can be alleviated by introducing private IP addresses. These are provided for internal communication within an organizational environment. These were determined by what's known as the IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and they reserved these certain banks of addresses for private use, meaning that any internal organization can use these values over and over again in any fashion they want. And you see that there are different classes, class A, class B, class C. We're, we will talk about that in greater detail later on as well. Right now, suffice to say, Class A networks are very large. Class B networks are medium-sized. Class C are very small. But the key idea is that we can all use these addresses without concerning ourselves for who else might be using them because they reside on the internal side of your router. If I have a business and I want to connect to the internet, I have to have a router. But every router has at least two interfaces. One of them only connects to my internal network. The other one connects to my ISP or the public internet. So in order for me to access the internet, I really only need one public IP address. All of the systems on the inside of the router can use any network configuration 
that you feel is appropriate based on things like the size. So I could use the 192.168 address. You could use the exact same one and we would not interfere with each other because the public interfaces on your router and my router would be globally unique. It is the job of the routers to handle the translation of public to private addresses so that I can communicate within my internal environment without ever concerning myself for anyone else's configuration in their internal environment. Now, there is also a feature known as the Automatic Private IP Addressing Range, or APIPA. We'll talk about that in greater detail uh, very shortly. But it's yet another range of private IP addresses that uses the range 169.254.0.0 through to 169.254.255.255. That's a Class B sized network environment and is implemented if your environment is using what's known as DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. If you cannot communicate with your DHCP server, your system will default to assign itself this address. And this allows for other systems in the network that might also be unable to communicate with the DHCP server to also get an address within the same range so they can at least see each other. Again, we'll talk about that later on, but this is another bank of private addresses, meaning you will simply never see them on the public internet. So the introduction of private addresses greatly reduced the number of public addresses that are necessary. Again, I really only need one for my router. Maybe certain systems that I want to expose to the internet, such as my web server, but very few systems will actually need a public address. All of the clients on the inside of my router do not need a public address when implementing this private address configuration, as long as you have the public address on your router. Now, in this presentation, we'll take a look at what's known as the loopback address, as well as some other reserved addresses when using TCP IP version 4. Now, the loopback address is a special IP address that is designed for what's known as the loopback interface of a machine. The IP address is always 127.0.0.1. So every device that has a network interface that is using TCP IP version 4, has this address assigned to it by nature. Now, they call it the loopback interface because a packet that is destined for that address, 127.0.0.1, never actually goes out onto the real wire. It is just a diagnostic address that allows you to determine if TCP IP has correctly installed or bound itself to your network adapter. So no hardware is associated to the loopback interface. It is not physically connected to the network. It is essentially used to test the IP software with no concern for corrupted drivers or any other hardware. It quite simply is, has TCP IP correctly configured itself on my system. Now, the range of addresses for the loopback functionality actually covers the entire block, if you will, of 127.0.0.0 all the way through to 127.255.255.255, meaning that every address in between that range is not actually used in standard IP addressing. Now, we'll talk about that in greater detail later on but you will never find an actual IP address anywhere in that range. So in terms of that diagnostic capability that I mentioned, you can use the ping command. You can ping 127.0.0.1. And as long as you receive a reply, then that means that TCP IP has effectively installed itself correctly on your adapter. So it's almost always one of the first things you do 
when troubleshooting communications. Ping that 127.0.0.1 address. And you can do this yourself. Just go into a command prompt, type in the word ping, type in that address and hit enter, and you should receive a reply as long as everything is okay on your system. Now, some other reserved addresses, as mentioned, these are typically uh, implemented in internal LAN environments, and it depends on the size, and we are going to talk about that in much greater detail later on. But private addresses mean that they are never used on the public internet, so they are reserved. The 10.0.0.0 through to 10.255.255.255 is what's known as the private class A bank of addresses. And it's quite large in terms of its total number of addresses. But the general idea, again, being that you can simply use this on the inside of your routers within your environment without affecting the public internet. So I can use them, you can use them anyone can use them and they allow for in essence consistent configurations and for you to choose the appropriate size if you do have a very large network you might choose the 10 address range you don't have to it's your call but it's also very easy to remember 10.0.0.1 might be your router then dot two and dot three and dot four and so on are your servers and then anything above maybe 50 are your clients so they're easy to remember fairly easy to implement 172.16.0.0 through to 172.31.255.255 is the private class b bank of addresses and again we are going to talk about those classes in greater detail later on there are mid-sized networks if you will and finally, the 192.168.0.0 through to 192.168.255.255 are the Class C private addresses, and they are typically used in fairly small environments. So Class A, very large, Class B, the middle, and Class C, the fairly small. But again, none of those addresses will ever appear on the public internet. And you might recognize the 192.168 addresses if you have home internet from an internet service provider. Most of the time, you will see a 192.168 address for your home network. Now, the loopback address is also a reserved address range. Now, we talked about that earlier, but it simply means that you will not see these addresses used on the public internet. So they are also considered to be reserved. And finally, there is what's known as the APIPA addresses. This stands for Automatic Private IP Addressing. We'll talk about this in greater detail later as well. But in most LAN environments, clients boot up and request an IP address from a DHCP server or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. The server responds and says, here you go. Here is your address configuration. But if for some reason communications were disrupted, then a client might not be able to contact the DHCP server, in which case it's just sitting there waiting for a response. If it waits too long, it will self-assign this APIPA address, automatic private IP address, and it will always be in the range of 169.254.0.0 through 169.254.255.255. And again, this is typically used for diagnostics. If you have that address, then the problem was you were unable to contact your DHCP server. So it immediately flags this system as being unable to get an address. So if the DHCP server is down for an extended amount of time and there are a number of clients trying to get addresses, they will all get a randomized address within that range and they will at least be able to see each other. It's not the best solution, but it's better than nothing. Again, they can communicate with each other because they are in the same range of addresses. But again, it's better functionality is indicating the problem in that it was unable to contact the DHCP server. So now you know just by looking at that address 
that there's some kind of issue between the client and the DHCP server. So again, all of those addresses are reserved, meaning you will never see them used in the public internet. And this allows you to configure your own networks inside of your own environments with those private addresses without worrying about any other environment. We can all use those private addresses. But again, the loopback and the APIPA, pretty much for diagnostic usage only. Now, in this presentation, we will take a look at some other values that are typically assigned when configuring an IP address on any given system. The first one is the default gateway. Now, a gateway in and of itself is a network device that allows computers to access other networks. In other words, it's the way out, if you will. You must pass through the gateway to get to another network. Without a gateway, computers are isolated from the outside. Now, that said, it means that the default gateway is actually not a necessary value to be able to communicate, but those communications would be limited to your own network. You would never be able to gain access to the internet, for example, without a default gateway. So functionally these days, it is required, but not 100% necessary for just internal communications only. Now, the term default gateway is used quite interchangeably with router because a router is typically used as the default gateway. So default gateway is more of a characterization, if you will. It does not have to be an official router. It is possible to simply use a computer with two network adapters to act as the default gateway. So it's still performing the same job. You can simply install two network adapters, one connected to the local subnet and the other connected to the outside network, and it will perform the functions of a gateway. But in most cases, it is an actual router. So again, in practical terms, default gateway and router are used quite interchangeably, and that's fine. But a router is the official device, whereas a computer can act as a gateway. Now, in terms of some of the addresses, you will likely see the default gateway in many cases will have an address of maybe 192.168.0.1 or 1.1, typically utilizing the first available address within that subnet, or maybe the last available address. The 192.168.0.254 represents the last usable address. 10.0.0.1 would also be the first available address, but that's a different class of network. Now, it really is up to you, but you might recognize the 192.168.0.1. If you have home internet, there's a very good chance your router is using that address or 1.1 or 2.1. Again, it's not critical. You really could use any viable address, but it's a common practice to use the first address or the last address of any given subnet for the default gateway. Now, the other component is the subnet mask, and we will talk about this in much greater detail when we get to subnetting, but you have to have a subnet mask. So in terms of being 100% necessary, you need an IP address and a subnet mask. That will allow you to communicate, but again, without a gateway, you can only communicate within your own network. So again, functionally these days, a gateway is required, but you have to have a subnet mask. So every IP address consists of two portions, a network address and a host address. And to envision this, imagine the street you live on. If you are in a house, that house has a number to uniquely identify your house. But there are many other houses on the same street. So the street is consistent to all houses. That would equate to the network portion of the address. But the number on your house uniquely identifies your house on that street.
So there are two portions, the street and the number. The exact same thing happens with IP addresses. You have a portion of the address that identifies your network and a portion that identifies the specific host on that network. So these three that you see here are just what's known as the default subnet masks, depending on the size or the class of your network. So if you are on a class A network, the default subnet mask is 255.0.0.0, meaning that there is one chunk of eight bits, we'll talk about that in greater detail later on as well, allocated to identify the network. There are then three chunks of eight bits or 24 in total to identify the host. In a class B subnet, the default is 255.255.0.0. It splits right down the middle. So 16 bits to identify your network, 16 bits to identify your host. And finally, the class C is the opposite of the class A. There are three chunks of eight bits to identify the network, only one bit to identify the host. So what that boils down to is that class C networks are very small. There are only eight bits available to address the hosts on any one class C network, but there are an awful lot of class C networks. Class B are medium sized, and again, they split right down the middle. So there's 16 bits to address your hosts, 16 bits to address the network, and class A are very large. 24 bits available to address host systems, but there aren't very many class A networks, only eight bits to address the network itself. Again, that will become clearer when we talk about subnetting, but class A's, simply put, very large, class B's, medium sized, class C's, very small. But again, there are a lot of class C's, a medium number of class B's, not very many class A's. So when configuring any system with its IP configuration, you must supply an IP address and a subnet mask, again, as 100% necessary values. And then if you want external communications, you must also configure a default gateway. In this presentation, we'll take a look at virtual IP addresses, or VIPA, and this is an IP address that doesn't correspond to a specific or physical network interface. You'll commonly see this in servers in a cluster or in load balanced web servers. Now, to clarify those, a cluster is a group of servers that all perform the same function. If, for example, you have a database that is particularly critical to your environment, then you really don't want it to ever go down. And if you have only one server hosting that database and the server goes down, you have lost your database. So the cluster is a collection of servers that all maintain the database. So if one goes down, there is another copy on another server that can assume the services of that server. So in that regard, from the perspective of a client accessing the database, they need to be able to hit either copy of the database on either server. And in fact, you can have more than two. In certain types of clusters, you can have dozens of servers. So again, from the perspective of the client, you need a single address to be able to reach the database. It doesn't matter to you which actual server responds to the request, as long as you get a response. So, of course, if you are talking about multiple different servers, they have multiple different separate network interfaces, and they would each have a real IP address. But I need a single consolidated address to use so that the request can be directed to whichever server happens to be alive and well at that point in time. So I access the virtual IP address. The whole cluster itself has this virtual IP address. 
And again, if the, we'll call it the primary server goes down, its address is lost, but the secondary server swoops in to save the day. It has its own IP address, but again, from my perspective, the address does not change. I always use the same virtual IP address, and the request is simply routed to whichever server can handle that request. A load balanced collection of web servers is rather similar, but it's more so for performance reasons than ensuring availability. So the cluster was to basically make sure there is always a copy available. Load balancing says we are going to implement multiple servers that will all service the requests at the same time. In a cluster, it is usually only ever one server that handles the requests and it will continue to handle all requests until it goes down. Then another server will handle all requests. A load balance configuration means I have three, five, ten servers that will all handle requests in a distributed fashion. So we balance the load across them all. But if there are five web servers all handling the requests, again, from a client perspective, I need a single IP address where I can submit my request. The load balancer represents the virtual IP address and it will then distribute those requests across to the actual interfaces of the actual web servers behind the load balancer. So again, it's from the perspective of a client. We need a single IP address that can then be distributed across multiple actual interfaces. So in terms of benefits, you consolidate the resources. You have one network interface per hosted application or service, again, from the perspective of the client. It's always just one address. You can improve the redundancy. Again, provide this alternative failover option on a machine. That's the cluster. The primary server has failed. Failover to the secondary machine. This allows services to continue. As well, you get virtually unlimited mobility. This allows the application to be moved anywhere without changing the virtual IP address if that primary server of the cluster goes down, for example, you can just bring in another server to take its place. If an application drops dead on one server, you can move that application to another server. So again, from the perspective of the client, I just continue to hit the virtual IP address. Whatever goes on behind the scenes doesn't really matter to me. So. That's the idea behind using the virtual IP. It shields the actual IP addresses that are used, but offers those benefits of improved redundancy, failover, and mobility. In this presentation, we'll take a look at DHCP or the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This is a client server protocol used to provide IP hosts with an IP address configuration. And it typically includes a subnet mask and a default gateway. And in fact, there are several other options that you can also include, such as a DNS server. But IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway, certainly very common. Now servers allocate these IP addresses from a pool of available IP addresses for the network and it's up to you as the administrator to determine what that pool is. But once you have it defined, addresses are allocated from the pool for a certain amount of time known as a lease. In most environments, you'll probably find it's about a week, but that's up to you. So in terms of benefits, it is a reliable IP address configuration. It minimizes configuration errors such as typos and duplicate address conflicts because if you had to address all of your systems manually, you introduce those possibilities. It offers reduced network administration because you can centrally manage and automate the assignment of your IP addresses on a network and you don't have to keep track of which ones have been assigned. The server actually does that for you. Now, in terms of the process, 
the client is configured within the operating system to request an IP address automatically. So when it boots up, it will realize this and it will send out what's known as a DHCP discover packet looking for DHCP servers. The servers will hear this and respond with an offer, say, here is an address. The client will say, that looks good. May I use that? That's the request. And the server will say, everything checks out on my end. In other words, no other system has requested that address. So yes, you may use it. That's the acknowledgement. Once it receives the acknowledgement, it can bind that address to its adapter and it can start communicating normally with an address. But one key point here, when it is in the process of requesting the address, it clearly does not yet have one. So unfortunately, all four of these steps are all broadcasts because the client does not yet have an address. It doesn't have it until it receives the acknowledgement. So it's a bit of a noisy process. And in fact, since it is a broadcast, if you had two DHCP servers, they would both hear it and they would both offer. So that's where the request comes in saying, well, I got two offers. I'm going to go with that one. So it's specifically saying, this is the one I'd like to use. And again, the server that made that particular offer is the one that acknowledges it. So again, a bit of a noisy process, but once you have the address, everything quiets down. Now, the alternative is static addressing. This is an IP address assigned to a host that was manually configured as opposed to using DHCP. The IP address does not change in this regard, hence it remains static. So some common use cases, your DNS servers and various other servers, your network printers, websites, things along those lines where you just don't ever want the address to change. With clients using DHCP, your address can change and fairly often. So static addresses eliminates that possibility. It will always have the same address. Now the advantages, well, it's very stable. You know Server X always has this address. So you can implement preferred addresses for your servers, maybe the first 10 or 20 of that particular subnet. You can always know where to direct remote access requests. If somebody's coming in from the outside through remote desktop, you can always forward that request to a specific server. And it reduces downtime because if the DHCP server itself goes down, you can end up with clients that are unable to get an address. So if that was the case with your servers, they would also be unable to get an address. And of course, that would result in downtime. But there are some disadvantages. Security, with the same server having the same address forever, we'll say, it does give an intruder more of a chance to figure out what that address is. And now it knows which system to target. It does involve manual configuration. So again, you are open to the possibility of typos and duplicates. And there's a little bit of additional DHCP server configuration. It's not major, but you have to ensure that the DHCP server pool does not include the addresses that have been assigned statically. So you have to avoid those ones. Now, APIPA is a related process to DHCP. It's a failover mechanism that still enables automatic assignment of IP addresses when the DHCP service becomes unavailable. So this allows for communication of other nodes on the same LAN using an address in the APIPA range. And that range is 169.254.0.1 through to 169.254.255.255. So in essence, what happens is the DHCP server goes down. Clients are trying to connect to request an address and they aren't getting a response. So after a certain amount of time, they will say, all right, let's just automatically assign this private IP address to ourselves so that we can at least communicate with each other. It's not the best solution, but it does actually give you a diagnostic tool because if you start seeing that address, you know the problem. The DHCP server went down. That's what that address indicates. So you know where to focus your efforts now. And when the DHCP servers are restored, the APIPA address is eventually released and a valid address will be assigned to those clients. And the final component is uh, what's known as a reservation in DHCP. 
This is still assigned by the server from the scope, but it is the same address permanently assigned to the same system. So it's an alternative to statically configuring your client systems. A typical reservation has a name, the IP address, of course, and the MAC address, which is actually necessary. That's how it uniquely identifies the recipient of the reservation. And then you can optionally give it a description. But basically you say that this MAC address will always receive this IP address and you know it is reserved. No other client will then get that address. So you can absolutely implement reservations if you prefer as compared to manual configuration. That said, there still is the possibility that it might change in that some network adapters are external. In that case, it's possible for that adapter to be connected to a different machine. Since it's tied to the MAC address, that same IP address sticks with that adapter. Now that's pretty rare, but it is again possible. So reservations allow you to still implement that consistency of manual addressing through the DHCP service. In this presentation, we will get started with taking a look at subnetting, but before we do, we'll also introduce CIDR notation or classless interdomain routing. Now, every host in an IP version 4 network is required to have a subnet mask along with its IP address. And the subnet mask is used to distinguish the network identifier from the host identifier. We touched on this before, but every IP version 4 address is made up of two parts, a part to identify the network and a part to identify the host on that network. And again, recall the analogy of a street. There is a single street, but many houses on the street. So the street is common to all houses, but the number on any given house is unique to just that house. So the street equates to the network. The house equates to the host on that network. So it essentially divides the IP version 4 address into these two respective parts. But subnet masks can be expressed in either dotted decimal or in CIDR notation. So we see both in the example. A subnet mask that divides an IP version 4 address in half would be 255.255.0.0. We'll talk about how that division works later, but that is dotted decimal. But using CIDR notation, it would be slash 16. That will also become clearer in a little while, but what that means is the number of ones in binary in that address. 255 is what we refer to as a decimal value, but every IP address and every subnet mask is 32 bits in total, divided up into four chunks of eight. So each octet, as it's known, is eight bits in length. So 255 represents eight bits. So does the next 255, so does the zero and the zero. It's just the value of the bits in binary that determines the decimal value. So 255, when converted to binary, is all ones. It's eight ones. Zero in binary is all zeros. So if you look at this in binary, what you would see would be eight ones dot eight ones dot eight zeros dot eight zeros. So the slash 16 indicates how many ones there are in binary. So there are 16 ones and 16 zeros. Of a total of 32, that's why this one divides it in half. So IP version 4 addresses are organized into classes for ease of distribution, and they're defined by the number in the first octet of the address and by the default subnet mask. So again, this will all become clear once we actually get into subnetting, but class A networks have a default subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. That means that eight bits, the first octet, are used to identify the network. The remaining 24 
0.0.0 are used to identify any given host on that network. Class Bs, the one we just saw, divide right down the middle. 16 bits to identify the network, 16 bits to identify the host on that network. And Class Cs are the opposite of A. The first three octets, or 24 bits, are used to identify the network, but only the last eight are used to identify the host on the network. So the more bits you have to identify any given host, the larger your network can be, meaning that class A networks are very large. There are 24 bits available to address your host. So any one class A is exceptionally large, but since there's only eight bits to identify the network, there aren't very many class A's. Class B's are medium sized, again, right down the middle, 16 bits network, 16 bits host. And class C's, again, are the opposite. There are only eight bits available to address your host, so there aren't very many hosts on any one network, but there are a tremendous number of class C networks. So again, class C networks themselves are very small, particularly compared to class A's. Now, class D does exist, but it's been set aside for multicast traffic, so it's not used for normal host addressing. And any network that does employ subnetting is considered to be classless. Now, you do start out with the appropriate class, but subnetting is the process of taking what is normally a very large network and subnetting it into smaller units, hence the term subnetting. So at that point, the class kind of goes away because the size that you create is actually up to you. Now, in terms of the values themselves that are used in computing, we have binary, decimal, and hexadecimal. Now, at the most basic level, it is always binary, but IP addresses from our perspective appear in decimal, for version four, that's the 192.168. whatever. whatever, or they appear in hexadecimal for IP version six. But that's just how we see them. At the computing level, if you will, they are binary. So the base values indicate how many numbers are there to work with. So in binary, there are only two base values, zero and one. In decimal, there are 10 base values the digits zero through nine, and in hexadecimal, it's zero up to nine. But then since we're out of numbers, we start using letters, A, B, C, D, E, and F, get us to the total of 16. For understanding IP version four addressing, we are going to focus on binary, base two. So this is what happens in terms of converting from one to the other. In binary, base two, what you end up with again is a certain number of bits available to address either the host or the network. And in any one octet, there are eight bits. So again, imagine the IP address 192.168.something.something. Each one of those values is eight bits in length. So this can be expressed by using an exponent. Two to the power of one gives you two possible combinations. You can translate that as base two, zero or one, means that there is a single bit that has two possibilities. It is either on or off. Imagine a light switch. That is a binary switch. It is either on or off. So if you have one switch, with two possibilities, then you have effectively two to the one. If you have two switches, then you have four combinations. It doubles because you have all the possible combinations of the previous value plus another value being introduced. So two light switches gives you four possibilities. Three light switches gives you eight. Four gives you 16. 532, 664, 7128, and 8256. So with a possible eight bits, you have 256 total combinations available to you. So again, this is why we are going to focus on just chunks of eight bits because each octet of an IP address contains eight bits. So if you have eight bits 
There are 256 possible combinations, but recall that computers absolutely understand zero. So if zero is the first value, one is the second value, the 256th value is 255, which is why you always see 255 in the subnet masks. Now again, all of that will become much clearer when we get into actual subnetting, but that's the key to understanding binary values and conversions in IP version 4. Now, in this demonstration, we will see how to get started with actual subnetting. But before we do, there are some things to go over with respect to the setup and what's actually happening here. And you can see that I have a host1 IP address of 192.168.0.100. Then I have a host2 IP address of 192.168.0.150. And they are both using the default subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, which is the default for a Class C network. This means that there are eight bits available to address my host systems. Recall from our binary conversions or our exponents that 2 to the power of 8 gives you a total of 256 possible values. Now, all of that said, the address as we know it is 192.168.0.100. But as you can see here on row 7, I have nothing but 1s and zeros. This is how TCP IP sees your address, binary values. So the first thing to cover is how you get these what we call decimal values of 192 and 168 and 0 and 100 out of ones and zeros. Well, each bit in each octet, recall there are eight bits, dot, eight bits, dot, eight bits, dot, eight bits. Each octet contains eight bits and each bit has a decimal value. That's what you're seeing here. And it's the same each time. The first bit is worth 128, the next one worth 64, the next 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Then that repeats and repeats again and repeats again. So to get a value such as 192 into binary, you just find the values that need to be turned on, if you will. A 1 in binary means include this value. A 0 in binary means do not include this value. So we see two ones. That means include those two values. Add them up. 128 plus 64, in fact, is exactly 192. So you turn on those two bits. All remaining bits of the octet are all off. 168 is the next value. That is 128 plus 32 plus 8. 128 plus 32 is 160. 8 more is 168. The other bits are all off. 0 is very easy in binary. All of the bits are off. 100 is 64 plus 32 which is 96, so those are on. We need four more, that's 100. The other bits are off. So again, as far as TCP IP is concerned, this is your IP address, not 192.168.0.100. And the subnet mask, 255.255.255.0, well, 255 in binary is all ones. Remember, we have 256 possible values, but zero counts. So all zeros is one of the values. That's zero, so the 256th value is 255. 
all ones. Add all of these up, you get 255. So that's 255.255.255. .255 dot zero. That's the subnet mask. And then 192.168.0, well, the first 24 bits here in host two are identical to host one because they are on the same network. This is where the division occurs. So this is the identity of the network. This is the identity of each host on that network same street, different houses. So this basically is what you need to understand when it comes to subnetting. It does not really come down to what these numbers are per se. It is the number of total bits available to address your hosts that determines the size of the network. So right now in its default state, I have 8 bits. We know that 2 to the 8 is 256. So there are 256 possible combinations. So recall that 0 counts. Therefore, we can only go as high as 255. So that's the range of numbers that I can use to assign my hosts. Now, one quick point. The value of 0, while it is a valid possibility, is never used to assign to a specific host. So in other words, you will not see 192.168.0.0 as an IP address. That is used to indicate to a router that it should ignore the host portion. Do not consider the host, only consider the network. Why? Because routers do not connect hosts. They connect networks. So 192.168.0.0 indicates to a router that this is the address of the network only. Forget about the host. So zero means no host in particular. The 255 value is kind of the opposite. It's actually the broadcast address. So where zero means no host, 255 means every host. So 192.168.0.255 is the broadcast address on this network. So 0 and 255 are not used for regular addresses. So the first valid address is 1 through 254. And that's always the case in all networks. The 0 address is never used, the one that is all zeros in binary. And the all ones address in binary is never used for regular host addressing. So these are the practical addresses that we can use. But there are still 256 possible values with 8 bits. So that's what's necessary to understand about subnetting. But before we actually subnet in our next demonstration, one other thing to know is that the subnet mask marks that division between network and host. The process of subnetting is, in essence, moving this line. That's what subnetting is all about. The line does not have to stay where it is by default. So that's why I have this dashed line here. This one is going to represent where we want to place that line. Now, that's difficult to visualize at the moment, but that's what subnetting is. We are taking this particular network and in essence saying, I think that's too large. Let's subnet it down to smaller units. How do you do that? Subnet mask, the bits that are available to address your host systems. So by masking a certain number of bits, fewer bits become available to address your hosts and you end up with a smaller network. Now that's what we'll get to in our next demonstration, but that is what's necessary to understand about the process of subnetting. All right, now that we have covered some of the basics of subnetting, let's take a look now to see how it is actually implemented 
And we'll begin with this default class C network. And I will tell you that in practice, you probably would not see a class C network ever get subnetted because the idea of subnetting is to take a network and make it smaller. Well, class C's are very small as they are. So chances are you just wouldn't see this happening, but the approach is the same for larger networks and class C's are a little bit easier to visualize. So we'll just work under the assumption that this network is too large and we want to turn it into smaller, more manageable units. That's what subnetting is all about. So recall that we have two hosts, host one, 192.168.0.100 and host two, 192.168.0.150. And as it stands in this default configuration, they are on the same network using the same subnet mask in its default state. So the division between network and host falls right here after 24 bits. This is the network 192.168.0 identical for both hosts. This is host 100 on that network. This is host 150 on that network. So as it stands, we have a single network that can accommodate 256 possible values. And we know that because there are eight bits available to address the hosts. And when it comes to subnetting, that is everything. It's not the value of these bits, it's how many bits there are. So if you want to make smaller networks, what you have to do is mask these host bits from the host portion. You effectively give them back to the network portion. So how do you do that? Well, again, you can see this solid green line marking the division between the network portion and the host portion. What you want to do is move this line. Now, I'll leave this one here to indicate that's where it normally falls. And I'll use this dashed line to indicate where we want to place it. So in essence, you do this. You drop this line somewhere. And wherever you drop it, the bits to the left of it end up being masked. So it looks like this. I'll start with just one bit. Now I only have seven bits remaining to address my hosts. So let's change this to seven. And if we look at our base two, we can see that two to the power of seven is only 128, not 256. So I have made a smaller subnet. But more to the point, I haven't made one smaller subnet. I have made two. How do I know it's two? Well, because this bit does not just disappear. It's still there. It is just hidden from the host portion. If I mask one bit, two to the one is two. Therefore, I used to have one subnet of 256 hosts. And again, we know in practice it's 254. We don't use the zero or the 255, but let's not worry about that for the time being. Now I have two of 128, but the total is still the same. Both of those equate to 256. And if, in fact, I did this and masked two bits, well, now only six bits remain to address my hosts. And two bits have been masked. So what have I done now? Well, let's go back to our base two. Six bits gives me 64 combinations to address my hosts. But two bits were masked. So now I have four of 64. The total is still the same. Four times 64 is 256. So the total number never changes. It's how you divide them up. But 
how do you move this line? There's no line that you drag back and forth in any kind of interface for configuring your IP address. How do you actually do this? Well, look at the default state. It's all ones, then the divisionary line, then all zeros. You simply continue that pattern. To move the line, these zeros become ones. That moves the line. So it's still all ones, line, all zeros. But as I mentioned, these bits don't just go away. You have to calculate now what this octet is in the subnet mask. It is no longer 255.255.255.0 because you have enabled some of the bits. Which ones? These two. 128 plus 64 means that your subnet mask is now 255.255.255.192. That's the sum of these two bits. Not only that, but in the CIDR notation, there are no longer 24 ones. Now there are 25, 26. So that's just another way to express the same value, but there are 26 ones in this subnet mask now. So now you end up with these smaller, more manageable units. Now, that does introduce what's known as subnet boundaries. We are going to talk about that a little bit later on. But to give you a quick idea, these two hosts are no longer on the same subnet. How do you know that? Well, the subnet mask has one other job. It not only defines the size of the network, but determines if any two hosts are on the same subnet. And it does so by multiplying the values of each bit against the subnet mask. So zero times zero is zero. Zero times zero is zero. Zero times zero is zero. One times zero is still zero. Anything times zero is zero. As long as you get the same answer on both sides, you are on the same subnet. But again, these bits don't just go away. So look what happens here. One times one is one. Zero times one is zero. Different answer. If you get a different answer, these two hosts are on different subnets and they will not be able to communicate with each other unless there is a router in between them. Now hold that thought for the time being. As mentioned, we will cover off the boundaries of each subnet in an upcoming demonstration. But for the time being, just focus on the numbers. We can now only accommodate 64 hosts per network because we only have six bits. Two bits were masked, creating four subnets. So that is how you determine the size drop the line wherever you want, and then it all comes down to how many bits are left to address your hosts. Now we'll see more examples when we subnet the class B and the class A environments in our upcoming demonstrations. All right, so now that we have seen how subnetting works, let's take a look at another example, this time using a class B network. And this would be much more common because class Bs are significantly larger than class Cs. And this is due to the nature of binary and exponents. Recall that a class C only allocated eight bits to address the hosts. So eight bits, is 2 to the 8, or 256, but class Bs allocate 16 bits to address your hosts. So that is significantly larger. 2 to the 16 is over 65,000 possible values. So that's far larger. And it makes sense now to subdivide this network into smaller units. A single network of 65,000 hosts would be far too noisy, if you will. So as it stands, we have one of 65,000. 
So again, the goal is to come up with smaller sizes for your subnets. Now, in terms of what that goal is, that is entirely up to you. You can come up with any number that you feel is appropriate or manageable. So it is fairly arbitrary, but let's go with something somewhat as a happy medium. And let's say that we would like to have 2000 hosts per network. We'll call that our goal. So what you need to do now is figure out how many bits are required to express that number. Now you might not be able to get exactly that because of the nature of binary, but that's fine. So 2000 is our goal. So let's go back to our base two. I've extended this to 16 bits and the same pattern continues. You can see that for two to the nine, I've already added the value for every bit you add, the total doubles. So if that's the case, then two to the 10 is 1024. Well, that's not enough. I want 2000. Two to the 11 is 2048. That is enough. In fact, it's a little extra. I can't get exactly 2000, but that again is the nature of binary. That's fine. If I have a little bit more, no problem. Any given subnet might have a few extra computers on it. That's fine. But it requires 11 bits to handle that many addresses. So that is where our line goes. So we go back to our class B here. We grab the line and we need 11 bits. Well, there's eight after the last octet. So I need nine, 10, 11. That is where my line goes. So how do we move the line? Again, in the exact same way we did for the class C's, it's always all ones, then the line, then all zeros. So we just continue that pattern. These zeros become one. And then we have to do the same thing in terms of calculating the value of that octet. So it is no longer 255.255.0. It is 255.255. Add up all of these bits. 128 plus 64 is 192. Plus 32 is 224 plus 16 is 240, plus eight is 248. These three are off, so this is 248. That is the value of the octet, 248. And in our CIDR notation, it's no longer 16 ones, it's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So we change this, to 21 and there is our goal 11 bits remain to address my hosts that gives me 2048 and I've accomplished my goal but again let's look at how many subnets were created it's not just a single subnet of 2048 I masked five bits back to our base 2 2 to the 5 is 32. So that's quite a lot of subnets, but each one of them is of the appropriate size. So 2 to the 5 now gives me 32 subnets, each one accommodating 2048. And again, if you were to perform the calculation, 32 times 2048 is approximately 65,000. Still the same total, it's just how they are divided up. So again, we end up with the same problem that we saw in the class C, wherein these two hosts are no longer on the same subnet. And as mentioned, we will talk about how those boundaries are calculated, but if we do the actual math here, the calculation, it's still the same. It's zero times zero is zero. 0 times 0 is 0. Anything times 0 is 0. So all of the systems effectively on the right of 
this line will be in the same subnet. But we can see what happens here. Within these subnet boundaries, we see that 0 times 1 is 0. 0 times 1 is 0. Same thing here, but look right there. 0 times 1 is 0. 1 times 1 is 1. Different answer, different subnets. So these two hosts can no longer see each other without a router. So that's always something you need to be mindful of. And again, we will cover off what those boundaries are in an upcoming demonstration, but the process is still the same. So you still drop that line wherever you want it. If you want fewer hosts, you move it more to the right. You take away more bits. If you want this to be a little bit larger, sure. Just keep going a little more to the left and just do the exact same thing. Drop the line wherever you want it. Change these values appropriately. Calculate the value of this octet. So now it's 128 plus 64 plus 32, which is 224. Update the CIDR. It's now 16 and three more, which is 19. And total up how many bits are on either side. So now we have eight bits plus one, two, three, four, five more. Now we have a larger subnet of 13 bits. Base two says, let's continue this on, 40, 96, 81, 92 with 13 bits. So that gives us two to the 13, which is approximately 8,000, we'll call it 8,200 hosts per network. But how many subnets? Two to the three. Base two says two to the three is eight. So we now have only eight subnets of approximately 8,200 each. And guess what? Multiply that together, you still get approximately 65,000. So again, figure out the size that you want, place the divisionary line in the appropriate location, tally up the bits, that gives you your total number of subnets and your total of hosts per subnet. All right, our final example of subnetting is the class A. And in this case, I'm going to show you an example that is actually rather common. And uh, it involves subnetting it to such a degree that it actually looks like the size of a class C. And this is because class A's are by default exceptionally large. You can see that we have 24 bits available to address host systems in class A's. That actually equates to over 16 million possible values in theory. So who would have a network that large? It's bordering on the ridiculous. So we typically will subnet the class A's to a significant degree. Now, again, the size of any given subnet is your call. You can place that line wherever you want. But as mentioned, a fairly common scenario is to do this because a class C is a very reasonable size. Eight bits remain for your hosts. That's 256. Most networks aren't much larger than that in small to medium organizations. So it depends on the size of your environment, of course. But again, it all comes down to what you feel is an appropriate number. But I just wanted to show you this one because it is fairly common. I wouldn't be surprised if you actually saw this configuration in your own organization. So by masking 16 bits, 
we end up with a tremendous number of subnets, but whether or not you use those subnets in practice really doesn't matter. This is a private address configuration. So even if you only used one of them, it doesn't matter. The rest of the public internet does not care what you do with private addresses. You can use them however you want. I can use them however I want. We will not interfere with each other, even though I'm theoretically discarding possibly thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions of addresses. It just doesn't matter because it's all internal. The public internet does not care what happens on the inside of my router. So in terms of the process, nothing changes. You still drop the line wherever you want it to be, and you do so by changing the zeros to one. So we can just change every one of these from zero to one, and that is how you move the line. And then it's always just a matter of totaling up the number of bits that have been masked. So in this case, 16 bits were masked. That, as we have already seen, is 2 to the 16, which is about 65,000. So thousands upon thousands of subnets, but any one of them accommodates only 256 hosts. So again, the default was one network of 16 million. Now we have about 65,000 subnets but each one is only 256. And again, if you multiply both of those together, you will still get the same total number of hosts. So we still have to do the same thing with our decimal values of the subnet mask. It's no longer 255.0.0.0. We've changed every bit in both of these octets to one. So that means that the subnet mask is 255.0.0.0. 255.255.0. So that's why I say it looks like a class C. That is the default subnet mask of a class C. But in this case, it's just a very heavily subnetted class A. Your class never changes. That's based on the address that you use. And the 10 address is always a class A, no matter if it's subnetted or not. So the CIDR also has to change. We no longer have just eight ones. We have fully 24 ones. So this is slash 24. And we end up with the same problem in terms of these two hosts no longer being on the same network. And we can see it in several places here. There's one right there. Zero times one is zero. One times one is one. As soon as any bit value comparison comes out to the different answers, you are on different subnets. But we could readdress these hosts if desired. Or maybe you are going to have several hundred, possibly even thousands of subnets. Again, that's up to you. But now we have much more manageable sizes in terms of each subnet. And if you have to route between this one and this one and this one and that one, that's fine, but it's always your call. You decide for yourself what is the manageable size. So again, in this scenario, we've gone all the way down to only eight bits remaining, giving us 256 hosts per network. And if you feel that's appropriate, by all means, feel free to implement this configuration. So at the end of the day, it is your call. You can decide for yourself which class you want to use and how large any given network and or collection of subnets will be. It's always your call. That's the idea behind the private addresses. Use them however you want. If you waste thousands upon thousands or even millions of addresses, it just doesn't matter. Everyone can implement the private addresses however they see fit, and it just never affects the public internet, nor does it affect anyone else. As long as you are doing this on the inside of your router, then you can choose whichever configuration you feel to be appropriate. So why even bother with 
subnetting the class A to such a degree, why not just use the class C's? Well, you can. That's perfectly fine. But one reason is that corporate environments tend to shy away from the 192.168 addresses because those are always used in home networks, or at least very, very commonly. If you go and look at your own configuration in your home environment, there's a very good chance you would see 192.168.something.something. So does that mean your corporate environment can't use it? Not at all, but a lot of people work from home and connect to the corporate network. And if that's the case, you don't want to be getting something like a 192 address over something like a VPN because it might actually end up conflicting with what you have in your own home network. So generally, corporate environments tend to shy away from those 192.168 addresses. And that's only one example why, but the other reason why you tend to see this address somewhat commonly is because it's easy, it's simple. 10.0.0.1.2.3.4.5 and so on. It's easy to remember. So again, it's a common implementation in a lot of corporate environments. Use those easy to remember addresses. The fact that they are very large networks doesn't matter. We just subnet it down to an appropriate size. And if we discard or waste a lot of addresses, it is really no big deal. So again, it is ultimately up to you, but the process of subnetting itself does not change. It's always about finding the appropriate size of hosts per network and then placing that line wherever is necessary to accommodate that number. Now, we've seen in our previous demonstrations how you can subnet any given network down into smaller units. And that is certainly very common, but there is, in fact, an opposite approach known as supernetting. And we'll take a look at how that's done in this demonstration, but before doing so, the concept is the exact opposite of subnetting. Subnetting is taking a single network and breaking it down into multiple smaller units. Supernetting is already having those multiple smaller units and putting them back together, if you will, into one larger one. Now, for this example, I've made some changes to the configuration of the two host addresses, and I've gone back to the class C. And the reason for that is because a class C network is fairly small, only 256 possible values. So if you have two class C networks, then you have to route between them for everybody to see everybody. And we can see that in the configuration of these two hosts. I've made the host portion the same for both of them. So host one is 192.168.0.100. That has not changed since our earlier demonstration. But I've changed host two to 192.168.1.100 still. So the host portion is the same, but the network portion has changed. 192.168.1.100 zero is a different network than 192.168.1. And again, you can see it in binary. Everything is the same right up to this very last bit. So there is a zero at the last bit. Now we see a one at the last bit. So everything up to that point is the same. But recall that a subnet mask will always determine if any given two hosts are on the same network by multiplying the values. So you can see here, zero times one is zero. One times one is one. Different answer, different networks. So as it stands, these are two separate hosts 
on two separate networks. So in order for them to communicate with each other, there has to be a router between those two networks. So that's perfectly fine as it stands. But since the class C network is not very large anyway, only eight bits or 256 hosts, rather than having a router between them, you can actually supernet these two class C networks back together into a larger network. So the process is similar to subnetting, it's just the direction that changes. Recall that for subnetting, this line was moved and it was always moved farther to the right. So that's its default location. We always borrowed bits, if you will, from the host portion and gave them to the network portion what we are going to do now is the exact opposite. The line will move the other way. So instead of moving to the right, it will move to the left. So now what we have done is we have allocated nine bits for the host portion. These original eight plus this one. So again, that's the normal location of the line for a class C, leaving eight bits. But if we move it one more to the left, now there are nine bits. So how do we move it to the left? Well, when we moved it to the right, we changed the zero to a one. To move it to the left, you do the exact opposite and you change the one to a zero. That is now supernetting these two networks back together. Now there are nine bits available to address your host systems, and you have doubled the size of this network. Because recall from our base two, that two to the nine is 512. So now this configuration that used to be two networks of 256 each is now one network of 512. And since you changed this value to a zero, the multiplication against the subnet mask will still equate to zero. Zero times zero is zero. One times zero is zero. Anything times zero is zero. Therefore, as far as TCP IP is concerned, these two hosts are in fact now on the same network. The network now ends after only 23 bits. So our CIDR notation is no longer 24. It goes the other way. It goes down to 23. And our decimal notation is still 255.255 but our third octet is no longer 255. The one bit has been disabled. So the third octet value is 254. And that supernets those two networks back together into one, and you no longer need the router in between them. All addresses from zero up to 254, 0.254, then 1 up to 254 are now on the same network. So again, the 2 of 256 are now 1 of 512, and all of these systems are able to see each other. So supernetting is typically done in an environment where you think, you know what, those networks are possibly too small. We now have too many routers. So let's increase the size of any given collection of networks. Let's put them back together and we can remove the routers. So now you have less router administration to deal with. So it kind of depends on what you have when you arrive, if you will. You know, when you get into any network environment and you assess its configuration, you always have to take into account why is it this way and is there a better way to do it. And in some cases, subnetting is absolutely the answer. But sometimes supernetting might be a better approach. If you just are looking for larger networks, 
then you supernet. If you are looking for smaller networks, then you subnet. But you always have that option. That line can really go anywhere. Now, you wouldn't want to be extreme with it. Typically, smaller movements are better, but it really can go anywhere. There's no rule that says you can't drop it here or here or here or here or anywhere. It just comes down to what you feel is the most manageable scenario. But sometimes larger is more manageable because it reduces the number of routers. And that is the essence of supernetting. All right, our final step in understanding subnetting is recognizing the address boundaries that get created when you take a single network and subdivide it into multiple smaller units. Because again, the total number of available addresses does not change. It's just how you divide them up. So we'll begin with the class C because again, it's fairly simple to visualize because it's nice and small. But I've already configured the subnet and you can see here that in this example, I have masked two bits, leaving myself six bits to address my hosts. So two to the six is 64. Masking two bits gives me two to the two subnets. So where I used to have one network of 256 addresses, now I have four subnets of 64 each. Therefore, there has to be defined boundaries for each subnet because I can only accommodate 64. So we'll call the first one subnet A, and the first address is no different than what it would be in its default configuration, 192.168.0.0. Now again, we do not use the zero to address any hosts, but it's still in this range. So if I start at zero and I can only have 64 addresses, then 63 is the last available address on this subnet. That's it. That's the end. I can only have 64 per subnet. So if 63 marks the end of the first subnet, then 64 starts the next one. So subnet B starts at 64, and then you include 64 for a total of 64 in that subnet brings you to 127. Subnet C starts at the next available value, 128, and goes to 191, and subnet D from 192 to 255. And again, you do not use the 255, but it's still in that range. So those are the four defined boundaries of the subnets in this particular configuration. So as soon as you identify the total number of hosts per network, 64 in this case, you effectively count by 64. That's your increment, if you will. Now, had I done something like this, then this is only two to the five. That's only 32, but I have twice as many. So the number of hosts per subnet was cut in half, but the number of subnets doubled. So I would now have eight of 32. And subnet A would be 192.168.0.0 up to 31. B would start at 32 and go to 63. And you just keep continuing on. So again, as soon as you identify that total number of hosts per subnet, that becomes the number you count by. Now, the class Bs are a little trickier because they typically have more hosts per network. But let's go over this one. In this case, I have masked six bits, which we just saw, two to the six, is 64. And I have left myself 10. Two to the 10 is 1024. So again, where I used to have a single network of 65,000, more or less, I now have 64 subnets of about 1,000 each. So as I said, it's a little bit trickier to recognize the pattern here, but subnet A still starts at the first address, 172.16.0.0, and ends at 172.16.3.255.
Now, think about any one octet for a moment. And let me just go up to my formula bar. I'll highlight this. And let's just look at this last octet here. Okay, so we know that a single octet can range from 0 through to 255. That's 256 addresses. But that's only within one octet. Well, I can accommodate, in my case, 1,000 per subnet. So once I hit 255, I've got nowhere left to go. I can't go to 256 or 257 or 258. That's invalid. So 255 is as high as I can go within the zero octet. So once I hit 255, I need to do this. One. Then I get zero to 255 again. And now I'm at 512. Once I hit 255, I've maxed out that last octet again. So now I have to increment this again to two, and I get another 256 addresses, and I'm at 768. Then I increment to three, and another 256 addresses, and I'm at 1024. That is the end. So 3.255 is the last available address of the first subnet. So you see it carry on into subnet B. If A ended at 3.255, then subnet B starts at 4.0. So again, I need four octets worth of approximately 250 computers to reach 1,000. So I need the four octet, the five octet, the six octet, and the seven octet. That's four octets of about 250 each getting me about a thousand carry that on subnet c 172.16.8 through to 11.255 that's the eight octet the nine octet the 10 octet and the 11. so again it's four octets worth of about 250 each getting me a thousand per subnet so we see host one here in the very first subnet we don't see host 2 using 32.150 until way down here. This is not the last subnet. Again, I have 64 of them. So that just keeps carrying on until you exhaust the entire address space. But you can see these two hosts are quite far apart, if you will. But it's still the same process. So again, a little trickier. That will take some practice. But it's always still recognizing how many hosts per subnet you have. And finally, the class A. This one actually is fairly simple if you go with this configuration. But this is another reason why the 10 address range with the class C type of subnet mask is used because it results in very easy to recognize subnet boundaries. Each subnet holds 256 computers. Now we have tens upon tens of thousands of them. But subnet A starts at 10.0.0.0 and goes to 10.0.0.255. That's it. There's my 256 addresses. That one is done. Simply increment the next octet. And you have 10.0.1.0 through 1.255. 2 .0 through 2.255. 3.0 through 3.255 and again you just keep going so it just goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 and you just keep going so again those are fairly easy to recognize in this particular configuration but i do want to stress that that's only if you are using this configuration and the same goes for the class b this you know is perfectly fine when you have a thousand hosts per network but if i do this now there are 2,000 hosts per network, and the size of each subnet doubles. So subnet A would start at the 172.16.0, but it wouldn't end until what used to be the end of subnet B, because it's now twice as large. So as I said, that will take some practice, but the more you do it, the easier it will get. And it's always just a matter of the number of hosts per subnet that determines the boundaries of that subnet.